everybody. I think we'll make a start. Um, so I'm incredibly excited to be um, telling you about the first speaker who's invited by the Society and Ethics Research Group. So this is a new group that we've got on campus, part of the um, Courses and Conferences and Public Engagement family. And you'll be hearing about this family more over the, over the coming weeks. Um, but our so, uh, Society and Ethics Research Group is very interested in the impact of genomics on real people, on patients, on families. And that chimes very nicely with our speaker um, who's coming to present to you now. So Dr. Vicky Chico um, is a specialist in law and healthcare, and she's from the University of Sheffield. And she's going to be telling us about a case um, that has been in the media recently and will likely be in the media again in the new year. A fascinating case um, that is likely to have an impact on how patients and families are dealt with in a healthcare setting um, in terms of the communication of genetics through families. Um, so I'd like to hand over to Vicky and hopefully this will inspire lots of uh, debate and interest. Thanks. Roman microphone's working. That, that seems to be working. Okay, so thank you for having me. It's been it's really nice to come and see the place that you work, particularly as uh, uh, I'm from the law school in Sheffield, where we work in a really old hospital, and where we do our public engagement is actually the uh, mortuary that was part of that hospital. So it's been a kind of old-fashioned building. Um, so what I want to talk about today is a case that um, is currently making its way through the English legal system. Uh, and this case is called ABC and St George's Healthcare. I was chatting to Anna earlier about what ABC stands for, um, and really that is to maintain the anonymity of the uh, claimant in this case, so the victim's initials, um, and the defendant is St George's uh, Healthcare. Um, this case has been heard by the High Court, and it's due to be heard by the Court of Appeal. Uh, and I've been writing on this case uh, and publishing all of the Oh, right. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll stand behind here. Um, uh, in, in, in the current edition of the Medical Law Review, so if you are interested, uh, kind of if what I say today is, is, is built on it in that paper in the Medical Law Review. So this case is about sharing genetic information in families. Uh, and the main question is when should genetic information be disclosed to an unsuspecting relative? This isn't a new question. This is a question that's troubled genetics professionals um, for many, many years. It's just that the law tends to lag massively behind professional practice. Um, so as lawyers, even, we've known this is coming, really, this case. And it's, so it's not just a legal question. It's very much a professional question. It's a question of professional ethics. Um, and like I say, geneticists and genetic counsellors have been grappling with this for years in a kind of legal vacuum where they don't actually know what their legal responsibilities are. Um, so this has been a very interesting case for me uh, as somebody thinking about duties of care in that area, but also for people working with um, families who are affected by genetic disease. So as is usually the case, we had a bit of a flurry um, we knew this question was existing in the background as lawyers. Um, it hadn't. It had been considered many, many times by professionals, but the law had never considered this question. There had been cases settled out, settled out of court, and that tends to filter down to the profession, but the courts had never considered these issues. So we actually had two cases. Now, I'm going to focus on the first case here, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about the facts in, the mo in, in a moment, but I just want to flag up a difference between the two cases that the High Court, so they've only been heard in the High Court, both of these cases, they've not gone to any of the appeal courts uh, yet. Um, but one of the key differences in these cases was that in ABC and St George's, which is the case that I'm going to talk to you about, there was a breach of confidence. A uh, breach of confidence was an issue um, because the patient didn't want their genetic information to be passed to their family member. Um, and in the second case of Smith and the University of Leicester, um, there was no um, potential breach of confidence because this was a case where the family actually supported the sharing. So in both cases, the question, the crucial question for the courts was, does the geneticist owe a duty of care to pass information to family members so they can be protected from the harm that might occur as a result of that genetic risk? 
Um, and in both of these cases, the uh, courts were quite clear that the genetic professionals don't owe a duty of care. Um, this question is still up in the air because the first case is going to appeal and it's a very, very high profile appeal. Um, but it's a crucial difference when you're thinking about legal duties that one of these cases concerned also a breach of confidence and the other didn't. But even where there's no breach of confidence, the courts are currently saying there's no duty of care, even where that's, the, the warning is supported by, by the patient. Okay, so I want to focus on the case that's the most important here. This is the only of these two cases that's going to appeal. It's effectively the test case. Um, so ABC and St. George's. And what happened in this case was a man shot and killed his wife. Um, and he was convicted of manslaughter on grounds of dis diminished responsibility. So there was um, a psychiatric element that had led to his, his crime. So he was sentenced under a hospital order, which meant that he... He didn't go to a normal prison. He was um, effectively um, maintained somewhere where he could be treated for his psychiatric condition. And what they discovered about this patient was in 2009 that he was actually suffering from uh, Huntington's disease. And there was a question as to whether or not that had been um, influential in the fact that he'd killed his wife. Um, Part of his treatment was that he underwent um, family therapy with his two daughters, who uh, he had obviously he'd killed their mother. Um, he was due to be released, um, and it was very important, this kind of family therapy, um, to the daughters when they were trying to deal with having their father back into the community. Um, so in the context of this relationship... Um, his diagnosis of Hunting Huntington's disease transpired. And around that time, his, one of his daughters became pregnant. Um, so this was in 2010. And the doctors caring for him wanted to inform his daughter. And they actually sought his consent to inform his daughter. They really tried to convince him that this would be a good idea. And he refused to let this information to be passed to his daughter. So the doctors caring for him didn't pass on this information. Um, his daughter then went and had um, her own child, uh, had a daughter of her own, um, and um, the daughter of the, 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 the person who was in, in prison was then found to be suffering from Huntington's in 2013. It's not actually clear whether her child has the disorder because she's still very young and it's not normal to test for the condition in children, but because her mother has the condition, the, as you probably know, there's a 50% chance that she then has the condition. Um, I wondered if I might just show you a really short film um, about Huntington's. I'm not a good person to explain what Huntington's is because I'm a lawyer and I'll make a real mess of it. Um, so it's a colleague of mine, Oliver Quarrell, who's a Huntington's disease specialist at Sheffield, who I sit on ethics committees with. So I wonder if I might just show you that just to kind of set the scene before I talk through um, the court case a little bit more. Just flick up, shouldn't it? Yeah, there it is. Hopefully it's got sound. Huntington's disease is a neurological condition. And what happens is that some cells within the brain and selected areas of the brain become sick and then eventually die. My mum had Huntington's and she'd been ill for years and I just wanted to find out and you know, find out whether I had to know or not. I did. Well, to have Huntington's disease, you've got to have a, a mistake in a specific gene. It's a condition which uh, affects basically movement, um, thinking processes and can often lead to, to periods of depression. And so I've, been, I've had the symptoms about, for about three or four years now. I've become a lot clumsier, like start twitching a bit more of late, uh, right shoulder once again. When I become stressed, I tend to mumble a bit and now again. And also uh, stress, that's a big one. It can be anything though, absolutely nothing, and it'll set me off. So. What you're seeing is, is basically 
progressive neurodegenerative disorders and uh, problems with the musculature. Seeing what it did to my mum, so I think it's laid the foundations for myself. I'm clumsy anyway, dropping stuff is part of my life, but before I got on symptoms anyway. So I'd be like, always wondering whether uh, I couldn't do that. The majority of people who are at risk choose not to be tested, but since the gene was identified, it's become a relatively easy laboratory test to measure the size of the gene. I'm obviously you understand that there are other people who, you know, can't find out. I mean, our family's all split, but then there's my brother and sister who, you know, have different views on it. My sister found out, so she was like, obviously got it. And, 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 yeah, I can understand my brother not wanting to know as well. I just had to say I was almost born and positive, but I didn't have it. And, and then I did. <laughs> but sure. It is important that if patients are having problems with depression, or irritability, or aggression, that, uh, that those are treated actively using the standard drugs that would be used for any patient with those kinds of problems. You can involve physiotherapists, you can involve speech therapists if they're having problems with their speech or having problems with their swallowing. I'm not sure that I'm going as bad as my mum did. She, uh, what she bought it from, any time she would be normal from, but at the same time she just flipped to going into, uh, she could be going into quite a nasty rage at times, and uh, she ended up being by herself with no one, and that's no way to go. My biggest fear at the minute is forgetting people. I've been, I know that it, that's my biggest fear really, is not being able to talk to people, you know, maybe not remember people. As far as it goes, um, there's no effective treatment to stop the underlying problem uh, within the nerve cells of the brain. So the treatment is effectively symptomatic and supportive. I rather think of it as a long illness and the needs of the patient change over the course of the illness. And so the sort of help that they require changes over time. And sometimes they need to see different specialists at different times uh, in the illness. My wife, Lisa, well, she, she's my rock, she is. She helps me day to day, gets me going. If I ever wonder, it's about to wonder if for any reason. Uh, like, yeah, little things. It's really a little thing, it really is. I try and keep as upbeat as possible. And I think that's helping me in a way. I really do. I think being positive about it, and, you know, not trying to hide it, it's helping me anyway, a lot. So, I think that's the best way I do it, really. Don't want it. <laughs> that will bring you down. It's bad enough that you've got to face it anyway. Right, women and bring you down. For more? Okay, so Huntington's is a really interesting condition in this context because, as Oliver Quarrell said, there's, it's symptomatic. Treatment is um, you know, the main kind of treatment for Huntington's disease. So in terms of legal duties, that raises very interesting questions because the law requires you to show harm before you have any claim in negligence. Uh, and it's very, you can't very easily show harm unless there's something that you can do to change the course of events. So ABC in St George's represents a really, really interesting case for lawyers from that perspective because what the, um, the claimant was arguing was that her the failure to tell her of her father's condition was actionable negligence because it failed, or because of that failure, she was unable to access her right to abortion. Um, because if she had have found out um, that she had the Huntington's gene, the Huntington's um, gene, she would have had legal right to abortion underneath the Abortion Act. So it's quite an interesting case that so she's claiming that her harm is effectively the birth of the child who would not have been born. So that in itself has raised specific difficulties for this uh, claimant. Even more complicated than that um, is that the, any duty to warn in this case would have come into direct conflict with the duty to maintain the confident, confidence of her father's um, medical information. So confidentiality is very much an overarching um, right when you access medical treatment, and it has a very important place in medical care. 
and people generally want their confidence to be respected. It's a very important public interest. However, you're right, confidence is not absolute. There are a number of grounds where the law allows for your confidence to be breached. Some of those are provided in statute. Um, but one of the growing areas at the moment is when can your confidence be breached in the public interest? Um, and my colleague and I, Mark Taylor, who um, is the chair of something called the Confidentiality Advisory Group at Sheffield, are doing quite a lot of work on trying to determine what's meant by this term of public interest. Okay, what is quite an amorphous, slippery term, and it means all sorts of different things to different people. But the law is quite clear. You can disclose a patient's confidential information when it's in the public interest. What does that mean? Um, well, some of the cases where people have brought an action for breach of confidence have concerned prisoners who um, are going to be released, who have actually um, are convict been convicted of violent offences, and information is, for example, going to be passed to the Home Office about their suitability to be released, and they've brought an action saying it's a breach of confidence. And the courts have said, well, there's a public interest in sharing that confidential information about you because you represent a risk to a portion of the public. Um, we've never had a case dealing uh, with a patient, a court case dealing with a patient, where they have argued, you breached my confidence to disclose information to my relative. And again, that's not because that doesn't happen in practice. The law lags again. I mean, I'm sure that genetic... Uh, genetic counsellors and genetics professionals deal with that all the time and do breach patient confidence where their professional ethics, so this kind of relationship between law and professional ethics, where their professional ethical code tells them that that's the right thing to do. But we haven't had a court case where somebody has come and said, actually that person breached my confidence and therefore I'm entitled to some form of, uh, of compensation for that. So this does put... Um, genetics professionals uh, in this very tricky situation where actually, you know, they know they have this duty to main maintain confidence, they know it can be overridden in the public interest, but actually trying to weigh that, they don't have any clear information about um, what might constitute a sufficient a grounds to amount to a public interest. Courts sometimes talk about a section of the public or an identifiable section of the public. They don't generally talk in terms of individuals, if you could protect one other individual from harm. In some ways, this case doesn't add much to um, determining when um, it's okay to override patient confidence. Because what they were considering in this case was not a breach of confidence. It wasn't the father arguing that his doctors had disclosed his information to his daughter, because that never happened. So it's kind of, um, although this case is about breach of confidence, as a lawyer, we tend to think very, in ver very specifically, they weren't telling us what would amount to a breach of confidence here. What, they, what the courts are telling us is when a warning will be justified. Clearly part and parcel of that is, well, when will it be okay to override confidence? But it's, they're not giving us a clear case of saying, Actually, in these circumstances, you can override a patient's confidence to inform their relatives. So the crux of this case <coughs> excuse me, was were the doctors negligent in failing to inform the pregnant daughter about her risk? Um, and although court cases deal with individuals, and there are two individuals here, or three individuals, because four individuals with her child and also her sister, and I don't have any information about her sister. I don't know about her Huntingdon uh, disease status or whether she's been tested or is showing any symptoms. Um, but cases are about individuals, but the courts are not really approaching this case as if it's about individuals because they know that if they decide um, that there can be a duty to inform relatives, that that has a much wider implication um, and it's in those terms that the courts have very much approached this case, more so than other cases. Sometimes they do seem to have some regard for the individuals concerned, but here it's been very much, okay, what is the impact on society of imposing duties on um, doctors to warn people of genetic risks? And one of the interesting things about this case is the doctors involved were, as far as I'm aware, not 
specialists in genetic medicine. They were um, more uh, doctors involved in treating the father as part of his hospital order, and they'd been generally t treating him for his psychiatric condition. Um, the judgment was fairly simple, that in this case, the public interest in disclosure um, did not outweigh the public interest in preserving confidence. They felt that it was much more important that people could be candid with their medical professionals, because this generally, it does apply to medical professionals generally, rather than just people involved in genetic medicine. That was more important than being able to give information to people that might allow them to avert certain genetic risks. So why was that? So there were a number of reasons for this decision, all of which was suggested to the judge by counsel for the defendant doctors. And there were actually nine reasons um, that effectively boil down or distill down to three key reasons. Um, and those three key reasons are these. First of all, that a imposing a duty to warn on doctors will have a significant impact on the doctor-patient relationship in terms of uh, if doctors are required to breach patient confidence, then it might affect the trust that patients place in them. The judge also, also thought it was important that this could um, impact on a person's interest in not knowing genetic information about themselves. Um, and he was particularly worried in this case that there could be some uh, adverse um, impact on people when they're given information that they don't want to know. And collectively, the judge felt that this, these kind of um, conflicting duties where it wasn't clear to doctors exactly um, what they ought to be doing would put too high a burden on them and would distract them from treating patients. They would be so worried about when they should be furnishing a warning and perhaps whether they would cause harm by furnishing a warning that it would distract them from treating patients. So I just want to talk through each of these three major reasons and... The piece that I've published in Medical Law International tries to make a case for a different approach to weighting the public interest in confidentiality and the public interest in uh, providing information about avertable genetic risks. So I'll try and kind of get the idea over in talking through each of these three reasons that uh, this case was um, rejected. So starting with conflicting duties. So a duty to maintain confidence on confidentiality on one hand and a duty to warn on the other. And some genetics professionals do actually um, seem to put themselves under this duty to warn. There's quite a lot of literature out there suggesting that people that work in genetics actually consider themselves to have a responsibility to warn. So again, this, the, the, the relationship between the law and professional genetics is... Um, sometimes conflict, and actually what the law often does, I, I explain this in a lot of different scenarios, is set a minimum level. It doesn't um, try to override professional codes, and actually there's this minimum level, but actually it's professional ethics that often sets the much more granular key kind of duties. Um, Interestingly, alongside this professional feeling that sometimes warning is appropriate, and actually it seems to often be to quite a high, um, in quite a high number of cases dealing with preventable disease that professionals think that information ought to be disclosed, there's a general willingness to share in families. Um, and I know the work that Anna's done, and I've done some work that's published in Human Genetics that shows that in cases of preventable and actionable illness, people are really eager to share information with their families. And actually, if you talk to people about their views on their own confidence, they're quite happy to forego confidentiality in order to warn their families. It's not something they attach a huge degree of importance to in families. So when we talk about confidentiality, particularly as lawyers, we talk about it as quite a general term. And it does have an importance generally. We want our medical information to be kept confidential. But there's a number of different bodies that we might be considering when we think about confidentiality. And it may be that our family isn't the key body that we're hoping to keep that information secret from. People talk about other things, employers, commercial uh, organizations, insurers. These bodies um, 
crop up much more regularly when people talk about the importance of keeping medical information confidential. So one of the um, ways that this might be taken into account is rather than what we currently have, which is this kind of default position, default legal position that confidence should be respected, that maybe there should be a case for reweighting these interests. And actually the law copes with that very well in the context of negligence, because it actually asks the profession to put content into duties. When, when doctors come to court because they've been negligent, or there's a, the, the, it's alleged that they've been negligent, they will ask other doctors, well, what would you have done? Would you have done this? And if other doctors would have done what they would have done, then they won't be found negligent. So it's not impossible to have that kind of um, duty that's, you know, a duty that where you, you add weight to each side depending on the particular circumstances of the case, and you're kind of trying to balance up some scales. Um, the particular worry for the court, for the High Court in this case, was that if you allow doctors to override confidence to provide warnings to patients, then you will affect patient trust. And they're really worried, well, if you, if you cause patients to lack trust in their doctor, they won't come to their doctor. And that's clearly a public health problem with a, a public interest. Um, in my view, that's quite a one-dimensional view of trust. And if you look at it not necessarily from a mainstream medicine perspective, but more from a genetic medicine perspective, the literature demonstrates quite a different um, approach to trust, um, at, whereby trust is about gaining the trust of families. Uh, it's not about gaining the trust of individual patients. And, I mean, even in mainstream medicine, you know, patients don't exist in, uh, in isolation, and doctors work in teams, you know, the multidisciplinary teams. So it kind of isn't unusual to be treating a family as opposed to a particular patient. And if just picking out two of the kind of major uh, players in this area, the Association of Genetic Nurses and Counselors, when they talk about their aims of genetic counselling, they talk about treating families. Um, and guidance by the Royal College of Physicians, pathologists and the Royal Society, the British Society for Human Genetics, um, speaks of trust, but it talks about um, the trust of families and how failing to pass on that information in families and failing to alert families to particular risks and treatment will affect the trust in genetics professional and genetic counsellors. So there's a different way of looking at trust, um, depending on your perspective. ABC was quite interesting in terms of um, thinking about trust and re-weighting uh, the kind of the duty to warn and the duty to maintain confidence. And I think there's a particular case for reweighting here for a number of reasons, um, one of which I've already alluded to, which was that the, the daughter in this case was already in a therapeutic relationship with the father, her sister, and the professionals caring for him. So it, it becomes quite... Um, it's not clear where that patient-doctor boundary where that actually was in that case, because they were undergoing family therapy. You know, she was seeing the doctors on a regular basis. So you could make some arguments about actually whether she could have been considered a quasi-patient or a patient at this point. Um, one of the other things that's quite interesting, I think, in this case, is that information that's in the public domain does not attract the quality of confidence. So if it's in the public domain, then it's not confidential. Um, and the information about his Huntingdon's disease status would not have been able to have been kept from his daughter for very much longer. So it was only just after she'd given birth to her daughter that she actually found out just generally about his condition. So only just after the harm had occurred, she found out. Um, so again, you know, what, perhaps this would have given added weight to the fact he was not going to be able to keep this from her indefinitely. And it was, you know, it was literally like looking at the line of that harm. It was just after the harm had happened that she found out. Um, and latterly were his reasons for not wanting her to know. Confidentiality is about protecting your private information, your kind of secrecy, your privacy, you know, your, about you not wanting other people to know that information about you. In his evidence to the court, he wasn't particularly worried about that. He just didn't want her to have an abortion. And he was very clear, don't tell her because she'll have an abortion. 
Um, and again, for me, that's very interesting because this is a jurisdiction where nobody has any right to interfere with the woman's right to have an abortion, which she would have had under the Abortion Act. She clearly fit the criteria. Um, not even the father of the child has that right. So again, he had interesting reasons for not wanting her to know this information that don't really sit with the sort of uh, essence of the duty of confidence. So the second reason on, on my side of reasons was that um, doctors have no way of knowing whether, and I'm, I, I keep mentioning doctors here, but that's partly purposeful because the judge spoke only of doctors. He didn't mention any other healthcare professional at all, um, which again are critical of in the piece that, that I wrote, that it's not just about doctors and patients, there's many other people um, that counsel patients and speak to patients, but he did talk very specifically about doctors. Um, have no way of knowing whether or not people want to be informed. Um, there's a lot of uh, emphasis on this idea of a right not to know in international uh, human rights documents. So the European Convention on Human Rights and Biomedicine talks about the right not to know. And I was saying to Anna just before, I, I don't really like to talk in terms of rights like that because this is certainly not a legal right. You don't have a legal right not to know information about yourself. So I kind of talk about it as the interest in not knowing. I'm quite happy to accept that in some circumstances we have an interest in not knowing information about ourselves. But this seems to be the default position again. So we have a default position of confidence, maintaining confidence. We seem to have a very similar default position of assuming that people want their right not to know uh, respected. Um, and again, I think the empirical research that Anna and I have done have, uh, has shown that... Um, Actually, the interest in not knowing is much less prevalent than we might expect. That actually, there seems to be this um, information eagerness uh, among people that if there's something about them out there, some information about them out there, they'd quite like to know about it. Um, and I think this particularly crystallizes when it's something that people can do something about. I guess that stands to reason, doesn't it? That if it's preventable or avoidable, people don't really seem to put much emphasis on to, at all on their interest in not knowing um, that information. And again, this makes sense from the legal perspective to actually focus a duty on preventable uh, or avoidable conditions. Because again, the law in this area requires you to show harm. So it only makes sense for legal duties to crystallise where you can avoid harm. I'm not saying that it wouldn't be good to warn people in other areas or that people won't want to know about things that aren't avoidable, but it doesn't make as much sense to impose a legal duty there because you may not be able to so clearly demonstrate harm if you couldn't have then gone and availed yourself of some treatment. Um, so these kind of things could be instrumental in waiting duties. So the final of the three uh, reasons for rejecting the claimant's case was that cumulatively these worries about um, balancing the duty to maintain confidence and the duty to warn and not knowing when people might want their right not to know respected would put an overly burdensome duty on doctors. Um, I kind of hope that in going through this I've shown that Actually, this duty, this very difficult duty, will only arise in quite rare circumstances, this very difficult legal duty. Because first of all, what you would need is a patient with a genetic condition that was relevant to their family member that could be prevented. So first of all, you'd need that situation. Second, it would need to be in a situation where the family member didn't already have some knowledge of that condition. And I guess in a lot of um, genetic conditions, people will already be aware um, of the, uh, that disease profile in their family. Um, and lastly, again, something that I kind of hope has come through is that families seem to want to share. So you've got to have a, somebody that doesn't want to share a preventable condition with no knowledge of that already in the family before, and a patient that, uh, um, you know, when you're looking at the, 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 the sort of... Um, tension between confidence and the duty to warn, you need to have somebody that's saying, I don't want you to inform my relatives. 
whereas it seems what the norm is, people just want support, that they will go and inform their relatives. So you just need to inform, you would discharge your duty in those circumstances by informing the patient, saying, well, this is relevant to your family, who would then, with the support of other people, be able to go and uh, share that information with their families. So all of this means that this problematic duty that's arisen in ABC and St George's could potentially be um, set within some quite clear boundaries that would make it workable. And the upshot of that is that if we could have a workable duty, we may be able to then prevent people from uh, suffering from genetic conditions that are actually preventable. So this case is due to be heard by the Court of Appeal in March 2017. It's actually it's been a very long time in the appeal, um, and it's any other time I would have been quite sceptical about whether the argument that there ought to be some duty to warn would actually be successful. But there seems to be a significant amount of support for this in the legal academic literature. Um, the barrister for the claimant um, is hoping to have some success in this case in arguing that there ought to be a duty to consider whether there ought to be a warning. Um, which is interesting because in the particular case of ABC and St George's, that's not going to do the claimant any, any um, favours because there was a clear consideration by the doctors treating her, uh, treating her father um, that he should, the information should be passed to her. They spent a long time trying to convince him that they should be allowed to pass that information to her. But nevertheless, it might influence a re-weighting in the future. If, if doctors are allowed to consider that, they will form this body of evidence that shows that in certain circumstances, the profession considers a warning to be um, the proper thing to do. And in other circumstances, they might consider that it's not essential to warn family members. Okay, so hopefully that's given you a, a good idea what this case is about and left a little bit time for if anybody has any questions for me. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Shall I just point yeah, the people? Yeah, you can do, yeah. Thank you. I don't mind. Sorry. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think what I'm saying is that if you take a number of criteria, the cases where you have a preventable condition, you have no knowledge of it, and you have a family member that actually is not keen on that information being passed on in their family, you are narrowing it down a lot. I mean, rare might not be quite the right word, but I, my, effort, my, my experience is that sorry, my experience is that in most cases, people are really keen to share that information in families, and that actually the cases where they don't want that information to be passed on are, are in the minority. And granted, it's, it's, it's only going to get in terms of how genetic medicine is moving, there'll be more and more conditions that fall into that slot of avoidable and preventable, and, and you can't put clear boundaries around that but I think again that that would be informed by the profession setting their own because that's how negligence works you don't ask the judge to say what's preventable and avoidable you get professionals to come and say in those circumstances I would have warned because x y and z if that makes sense Much later than he 
to know. I mean, I think one of the interesting things for me is just how professionals seem to consider them to have this self-imposed responsibility because some of the evidence, particularly from the states, is that genetics professionals consider themselves to be under a duty to provide a warning. And you see similar evidence in the UK. This isn't a legal duty. There's that, you know, if, if people come to me for legal advice now, I'd say you need to maintain patient confidence. Okay, there isn't any duty to warn. But again, we have, it's trying to marry up this legal and professional duty that the legal baseline is here. And professionals sometimes subject themselves to different duties. But if that continues, then we have actually here, we have a kind of mismatch, really, in terms of what the law is saying the duty is and what the, the, the duty that professionals consider themselves to be under. So I guess it worked out okay in your case, but, you know, it, it may have been that in an avoidable genetic condition, you could, and if you did have it, you might feel quite differently about the fact that nobody told you. Families as a whole often only get together at weddings and funerals and christenings, and, and they may be the time when you'd have those sorts of conversations. Um, but one of the, the things that um, genetic counsellors can do and geneticists can do is actually give easy to understand information that could go into a Christmas card and that could be sent around the family. <laughs> you know, here's what's in the family, Here, here's the explanation about what it is. It's incredibly difficult though. I don't know who was first then, sorry, I think you would. I think that's um, I think that's quite important because I'm kind of standing here arguing for a new duty of care, which obviously is you know is a really big deal, um, and any such duty would require infrastructure to uh, support professionals who would be required to actually put that in to into motion. Uh, one of my friends wanted to retrain. Uh, she, she's a nurse and I said you need what about genetic counsellor I'm sure there's just going to need so many more genetic counsellors going forward with you know the way that genetic medicine is progressing and the way that people are starting to think about you know what kind of duties professionals are under with regard to you know sharing information I mean the outcome of this case is going to have enormous implications for mainstream medicine isn't it i mean can you imagine the oncologist dealing with the patient with breast cancer um and the priority is to treat that cancer there and then but if they've now got an added duty to be starting to think about is this an inherited sort of breast cancer should i urgently sort out testing which they should be doing anyway for an inherited sort of breast cancer and i need to be telling the relatives that are coming in to see this patient while they're on the ward um, and informing them, and my patient in front of me not, might not be ready to share that information themselves yet, that this is inherited. I mean, we haven't got the infrastructure yet to deal with that on a mass scale. You mean make the decision to keep the information from them? This is one of the interesting questions in this case because the law on consent is extremely developed. So I would describe myself as a medical lawyer who specialises in consent across the board. So consent to all sorts of different things, consent to treatment, consent to be in clinical trial research, and consent to use of data. Um, and the law in relation to consent to treatment is extremely developed uh, and also in terms of consent to clinical trials. 
In this context, there is no legal uh, sort of structure to, into which decision making can be put. So normally, if you're making decisions about having medical treatment and running that risk, you know, because there's always risks involved in medical treatment, then you have to actually demonstrate quite clear capabilities. But none of that was applied to this case. So it is very interesting that he was allowed to make that decision, but I think because of the value that's placed on patient confidence, they never really inquired into whether or not he had the mental capacity to make that decision or not. Um, and the law does, it adopts this um, sliding scale approach to consent, whereby if you want to consent to something that's not particularly risky, the level of uh, capability that you need to show is actually quite different than if you want to consent to quite risky surgery. So I suspect they probably put not that much emphasis on his capacity to make a decision. be relevant. I mean, one of the dangers that I have to kind of steer in clear of is because, I mean, I kind of sit in that space, particularly because I did some research looking at when people want information and actually when people are happy to forego their own confidence and the, there's a huge willingness to forego confidence if that could help you. Well over 90%, and this was in a study of over 100,000 people, would have forego confidence uh, to give a family member information about avoidable genetic disease. But the difficulty is that that doesn't mean that the confidence of people who don't feel like that shouldn't be respected. So it's kind of treading that fine line of saying, well, people, we should still consider that people have the right to have the confidentiality of their information respected. But if we're going to have this kind of reweighting, then maybe th those kind of considerations should actually be part of that weighting. That actually, this was a situation whereby this, this family, you can imagine what this family relationship was actually like. Um, it was dif it's difficult to get from reading the case, but you know, he'd killed their mum and he was going to be released f back to the community with their support. And that was a very, very difficult situation. This did not help that. <laughs> Um, in terms of then suddenly she has a child in a situation where she would not have elected to be a mother. It's not really about whether the child has the condition, it's that she's a mum with Huntingdon's, which is going to make a difference to her ability to bring up her daughter. I think we're up there, sorry. Yeah, so I guess in one way I think this case would be much more interesting if it wasn't a fully intelligent genetic condition, like kind of something where mm. there's actually a medical diagnosis that has to go hand in hand with the genetic data. Because it is, to me, it just really feels like we're not really talking about a medical diagnosis that is like needs to be considered in the context of confidential medical records. I guess the default has been because most genetic information is acquired in a medical setting that it should be part of the medical record. But there's an argument to be made. You mentioned public domain that our genetic information is fundamentally in the public domain because we've been mm -hmm. lying around everywhere. It's just that it's technologically hard to access information, but that's changing very quickly. So I think in the long run it might not be relevant, like that genetic information is impractical to, to sort of keep private and that fundamentally it is public information and it doesn't deserve confidentiality treatment. And in that context, that's an argument that could be made here maybe, um, but it'd be more interesting to see a case that's also about that plus other which, you know, information which is fundamentally, you know, private to that person that something has developed in them that didn't necessarily have to develop and should we then tell the family when it's only a 20% how, how far down does the percentage go before we don't have to tell them? And how close of a family are we talking about? Because we're all really one human family, and your genome would help my medical care, and so would everyone else in the room, and vice versa. So there is an argument made in the public interest as well that all genomes should be public. Um, I don't know. I think, to me, it's not a medical question. It should be a, you know, okay, yeah, a that it's of the genetic sort of state okay. of genetics. Yeah, I, th I mean, I think that's really interesting, uh, and that's kind of one of the points that I try to make, that this information is not something that he could have kept from her long term. But, but I, I think you're right that, again, it, it, 
In some ways, this is an e easy case and it's a hard case. I mean, if the question was whether or not she should have been informed uh, just as an in a non-pregnant individual, it becomes very different because treatment is symptomatic, um, which in a legal sense, uh, it would be very difficult to make an argument for a duty to warn because there's nothing that she can do to avoid the kind of course of the disease apart from treat the symptoms. But uh, again, I think you're right that it... it this is not normally as straightforward to this. I mean, this is straightforward because she could have had an abortion. You know, nobody would have prevented her from having an abortion. She clearly fit the criteria, so there was something that she could do that was her legal right. Um, but when you kind of think about, uh, I guess, genetic, most genetic conditions where, it, you know, there's not, it's not just about a single... 100% penetrant gene where you're thinking about lifestyle alterations and where do you kind of draw the line in terms of thinking about what's avoidable and what's preventable. But again, all of that would be, if there was such a legal duty, all of that would be determined by professionals. So they wouldn't, again, be asking the judge to say, well, there was a 20% chance that it could have been avoided. What do you think? It would all be about, well, professional pr practice would evolve and protect professionals that... Um, can justify their decisions. That's how negligence law works. It makes sense. It's not about um, clear-cut lines. It's about, well, w what you did, does that accord with a reasonable body of your peers? So it would have to be judged in that way. And again, there wouldn't be a massive deg degree of clarity. I mean, I guess the flip side, the defense could also use the same sort of argument in that, you know, uh, she has that information already. She possesses it. It's in her body everywhere. Mm. All she has to do is go in and say, can I have a test for, like, Mm. If she has any of them, and then if she wanted to make, have an abortion and have a good basis for it, she could have done that. She could have done that. I don't mm. know if it just was gone with it, but she could have paid for it or whatever. It, she contains the information. So it's not like, you know, it, it's just the fact that someone else happens to know mm. or know like a 50% chance of knowing something. It doesn't necessarily mean that they should have to tell you. But I think everyone should just know. Yeah. No, that makes sense. You almost kind of, if it's not a medical issue, then there isn't a duty of care to place. I guess it's just that the way that that information arises is so often in the medical context and the way that we think about our medical practitioners that we put so much, you know, um, we expect so much of them, uh, really, um, that actually we feel aggrieved when they don't do things that they could have done to, to prevent us from suffering a disease. In where, sorry? Yeah, very kind of similar. Um, there have been similar cases, and what's generally happened, again, because you're thinking about one particular member of the public, usually, the courts take a very similar position, whereby it's quite difficult to argue that there is a public interest in breaching confidence, because there does seem to be something about a collective mass that makes a difference to the court's idea of public interest. Once you can show that there's more than one person at risk, so there is a particular case where somebody was going around infecting people deliberately, which played out under the criminal law system, which actually makes it <clears throat> not directly applicable, because obviously you're not considering any of these doctors under the criminal law system. So these cases have generally come against individuals who have then sort of infected people deliberately. But where doctors have been asked to consider that, consider whether there's a duty, what the courts have said is um, that they can discharge any duty by informing the patient of the risk that they pose to others. Um, so again, that works in, if, if I go all the way back up to the other case, um, this kind of case at Smith and the University of Leicester where actually the families were supportive uh, of the warning. So, you know, if you have the right support, I mean, the caveats that Anna mentioned earlier that actually people find it really hard to start those conversations and um, that actually you can go ahead and do that. The really difficult situation is where it, it conflicts with that duty to maintain confidence. And in the, in the sexual health arena, they haven't gone as far as saying, well, if you don't inform, 
we're going to let them know. Okay, sorry. I don't know. I don't know if I'm doing this in order. No. <laughs> That again makes this a really interesting case from the legal perspective and in the paper I very much focus on the notion of harm. Um, it's quite complicated because there's a whole um, area of law that's called wrongful birth and it mainly arises from failed sterilisation operations um, that has determined that to a certain extent the birth of a child that you didn't want can be considered harm. Um, so here, it depends on the perspective of the harm. I mean, the harm could be seen as the fact that her daughter might have the condition and she would not have elected to have a child with the condition and she will therefore incur expenses because the daughter has the condition. Or you could view it as the fact that she, as, as a person with Huntington's, would have elected not to be a parent because she would feel that that would involve interfere with her ability to be a parent and that's her stronger argument legally but it is a very it, this case is massively complicated by the fact that what she's arguing is she couldn't have an abortion because she didn't have that information if she'd have been arguing um if it was bracker or something like that it m would have made it it would make an easier case in terms of the harm that she'd suffered because she may well have been able to, if she did suffer breast cancer, she may well have been able to, to say, if I had been able to avail myself of preventative treatment before the disease had manifested, then I wouldn't have suffered this harm. So it really is um, complex, but because in this case, they're looking at individuals, but if any sort of duty is, does crystallize in this case, it will apply to more straightforward situations as well. I mean, it may be that, this kind of case wouldn't do very well because the harm is much more tangible. But then there'd be other kind of case, cases that would be where the harm would be much clearer. But without harm, you don't have any harm. Everything in law arises from harm, so you can't just bring an you know you can't just bring an action for failure to warn if you can't show that you are in some way harmed by that failure to provide a warning. So that has to be the essence of any legal claim. I was just wondering on a practical level for researchers conducting studies where we acquire genetic information, um, <coughs> what is the you know, safest uh, procedure say, to make sure that we don't face uh, you know, lawsuits, mm. don't disclose information, or the other way around, etc. So what is currently the legal situation and how might this change in the future? Well, anything that I say only lasts until March 2017 because <laughs> it's currently you know, everybody that comes into uh, contact with um, data that was given in the context of somebody being a patient will be subject to the duty of confidence in which that data was handed over, unless the patient somehow um, indicated that they didn't particularly want their confidence to be respected. I mean, you can consent to a having your confidential information shared, and it, it is no longer a breach, obviously, to actually consent to that. Um, there are a number of situations where confidential information is shared with all sorts of entities. I mean, the Confidentiality Advisory Group advise the NHS about when it can give confidential, pa identifiable, identifiable patient information to researchers. So this does happen. I mean, it's not kind of unusual for confidential patient information to be shared. People just, just don't know that it happens. But as a professional, currently, um, you know, the duty is to maintain confidence. And I think as researchers, it would be very difficult to justify a kind of independent warning to a patient. That's not to say that you wouldn't have a duty to feed back information to a medical professional if you found something, um, you know, that might be of interest. And then you kind of leave that with them, I guess. You've done your job then. 
uh, if you felt that there was something that was of particular um, relevance to that patient. But then that's more in the doctor-patient relationship, if that makes sense. There's certainly be no duty on you to cascade that information out to family members. Um, but also in a research setting, you just have a duty as a risk researcher to abide by what was on the consent form. So if um, a patient turns into a research participant and they've consented not to receive anything back from the studies that you're doing, then you don't share anything back. One more question? Mm. What's preventable is the existence of a person, yeah. um, which is always preventable if the mm. person was pregnant and that was known at the time. So how does the preventable condition thing apply to this case? Because the condition itself is not preventable. And it's not part of the yeah, so the preventability here would have been her right to have an abortion and not have the harm of having a child that she wouldn't have had. So it, it, like, it, it, it sounds really odd, doesn't it? But you know, and the law initially had a very difficult time with seeing that as harmful and initially it said sorry it's not a harm to have a child that you didn't want okay with the law's just not going to view that as harmful but then it had case after case after case after case of failed sterilizations where you know fallopian tubes had, uh, sorry uh, ligaments had been clipped instead of fallopian tubes and there were clear failures to take the reproductive project of the person in seriously almost so you know the courts it, created some quite defined categories of when it will be considered harmful to you to have a child that you otherwise wouldn't have wanted. So it's more preventable harm than preventable condition? Yes. So, the, so in this case, clearly, the, if, if, if she hadn't have been pregnant, this case wouldn't, I wouldn't be standing here talking about the case because she wouldn't have been able to demonstrate harm. Um, if it was a different kind of condition where there would be some preventative measure, then that might... Have. And I can't remember what the actual condition was in Smith, unless this, was, this dealt with paediatric genetic conditions, and I can't, I think it was a hematological condition, but I can't actually remember what it was, but it was something that could have been treated. Um, so it was a bit more clear-cut if they'd have treated this, if, if the information from the cousin had come through, then this child wouldn't have died. Um, I think we need to close there. Our time is up. Thank you okay. so much, Vicky. Well, that was thank fascinating. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.